Good morning. And it's uh, again a great, uh, great uh, honor and pleasure to be here with you uh, this morning here at uh, Bethany Community Church. And uh, um, my name is David Beakley, and I was here last Sunday. I'm here this Sunday, for, especially for the newcomers uh, that I know we're having a newcomers lunch here this uh, this afternoon. And I'm a missionary from originally, or I guess, living in uh, South Africa now, and been there since 2002, and was sent out by Bethany Community Church or Bethany Baptist Church actually in uh, in 2002. And uh, my family and I now live in South Africa. Been there. Most of our kids are now back here this side. And uh, and so it's just been great just being here back in the states for a few months, uh, just to visit. So for the newcomers that are here for this afternoon, I'll just have two. Uh, I guess uh, brief announcements for you. Number one, this is my last Sunday, so you're okay. Daniel, who you heard about, is coming back, and so he'll be here next Sunday. So this is a one-time event for you. Um, but secondly, just for the newcomers as well, just so you know, I was also a newcomer once and uh, went to Bethany Baptist Church in 1997. Somebody invited me because they heard the preacher was really good and. And so we went and heard and went, went to go listen to the preacher, but unfortunately the preacher wasn't there, and it was a missionary from Africa who was there. And uh, at the time I was working in Morton, Illinois, I had a nice secure job, and everything was great. So just so you know, if you were invited here as a newcomer, because you heard and wanted to hear about this young man named Daniel Bennett, you should be very afraid this morning. <laughs> Listen intently. <laughs> God will be speaking to you. So this morning, uh, we will be in a passage that uh, has caused great perplexity to many. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. We'll be in the Gospels this morning, where Jesus has this one little encounter that's only found here in Mark, not found in Matthew, Luke, or John. And because it's so small and only found here, we like to kind of run past it because we just hope our kids don't ask us about this. But hopefully through the power of the Holy Spirit and, God and His illumination, we'll be able to understand it this morning. So if... Uh, if you can got your Bibles now open in Mark chapter 8, we will read verses 22 to 26. And they came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. This is the reading of the Word of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we again come to you this morning. We're thankful we're thankful that we have a place of worship. We're thankful that you have given us your church. For Lord, without the church, we couldn't survive. Lord, you've given us not just a sanctuary or a place of like-mindedness, but, but it's a, a place we can gather together to worship the living God where we can exalt your Son high and lifted up on the cross so that others can see the great and glorious Christ for who He is. Father, all of us have come through a week living in a world that denies or diminishes your glory, redefines your Son, and tries to merge the culture and Christianity together. And we live in that, and that that vast morass that we, that we try to walk through all week begins to tarnish our faith, 
create doubts in our mind. And then we get to come here on Sunday and gather to have our faith emboldened, but more to have our joy rekindled because we can see the living God. We're with the living God. We can confess our sins. We can demonstrate our repentance to you out of our joy because this is the sole focus of this church. It's to gather for worship, not for community. It's to gather for worship, not just for confession or absolution in some way. It's because you are here that we can actually get an insight into who you are. Father, we do confess the difficulties of the week, but they're difficult because of how we take our eyes off you, much like Peter in the water trying to say, Lord, let me come to you, and we take a look at the waves crashing around us, and we begin to sink. Lord, our broken relationships, husbands and wives that cannot abide each other, children that want to run away from their parents, parents that want different children, jobs that are not secure, We're immersed in sin, weighed down by guilt. But Lord, you give us this time to see your Son, to give us His Word, Lord, so that your Holy Spirit can mingle together with the words that we hear so that by the hearing of the Word of Christ, our hearts are kindled aflame with joy to serve the living God. That's what we desire. We beg you, Lord, we ask you, we implore you that your Holy Spirit, Father, would not just be with us, but would be particularly active in stirring up our faith this morning, giving us illumination in our mind of your word. Lord, lifting us to the heights of what it is to worship just to sing as Israel did in the days of old, climbing up to the temple, the Hillel songs of praise, anxious to see the living God through the high priest. And Father, we are anxious to see you through the eyes, hands, and work of our high priest, Jesus Christ, alive and at work in our hearts, fueled by the preaching of your word. So, Father, we commit the preaching now to you because it is to you we preach. It is for you we preach for the benefit of all of your children here and those whom you are drawing near to you. So, Father, I humbly ask that also the preacher might not be standing in the way of your word and also be stricken by the conviction that those words bring as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, several hundred years ago, there was a German class of young boys in the elementary school that they had in teaching all the young boys there, and they were being naughty, so they were obviously doing what young boys do in, in a school situation. And... and, and the teacher was fed up, and so he got everybody to sit down in, the, in their chairs, get their slates out, get their chalk out, and I've got an assignment for you right now, and he assigned them the task of adding the numbers from 1 to 100 in a complete sum. So I want the number 1, then the number 2, the number 3, all the way to the number 100, add them up, I want to see the sum. So after a lot of whining, they got their chalk and they got their slates and they began to work. But there was one boy amongst them, just one. He didn't pick up his chalk, didn't pick up his slate. He just sat and looked out the window and gazed for a few minutes. And then he picked up his slate and he wrote a number. All the boys turned their slates in so the headmaster could look at it. This young boy's answer was the only correct answer. 
Well, he was amazed. The teacher was amazed. So he asked how the boy did it, and the boy just replied. He said, I thought there might be some shortcut. I found one. 100 plus 1 is 101. 99 plus 2 is 101. 98 plus 3 is 101. And if I continued all the way to 51 plus 50 is 101, then basically I have 150 times, so the answer is 5,050. Well, after that episode, the teacher then began to personally tutor that young student, leaving all the other boys aside. And that student was Carl Friedrich Gauss, the great mathematician of the 19th century who developed all kinds of particular scientific theories, dealt with the idea of magnetism. So whenever we demagnetize something, you, you, you degauss something. Or you this young boy demonstrated he had something more than just basic sight, where you could look at the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, but he had something special. He was looking for something different, something deeper, something that's in there, something that we would call insight. Insight. Something deeper than what you can actually see. And how this actually translates to sight, just a simple example, from both animal and human studies, we know there's critical developmental windows in the first years of life. Your sensory and your motor skills are developed when you're young. And if that opportunity is lost when you're young, then trying to play catch-up is hugely frustrating and almost impossible. Just as an example, there was a young boy that uh, was cured of blindness from cataracts. And when the boy's eyes were healed, they removed the bandages, and they asked him what he could see, and he says, I don't know. They put a hand in front of him. They said, what do you see? I, I don't know. I, I see varying degrees of light, but I don't know. And, and it wasn't, even when they waved the light, waved the hand in front of him, they could wave the hand in front of him. He says, I don't know. I, I see varying degrees of light and shades of light are changing. And the hand is right in front of him, and he can see it. It wasn't until he actually put his hand on the hand in front of him and actually touched the, the surface and felt the movement. He says, oh, it's moving. I can see it moving. Light and eyes were not enough to grant him sight. The doctor that was studying this wrote this statement. He concludes this, quote, to give back sight to a congenitally blind person is more the work of an educator than of a surgeon, unquote. You see, it, it takes more to actually see and understand than it does just to see. What is the difference between seeing and perception? It is not just light, and it is not just eyes. And the answer to this question does not come from science. It comes from theology. It comes from God. Even from the oldest time, some 3,000 years ago, David wrote this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How can David write this? Just a metaphor? Just saying, a light to my feet, a lamp to my path, your word? I mean, the Bible was certainly not something that you could walk in the dark by. But certainly in the darkness of sin, the darkness of thinking wrongly, absolutely. David was a man who lost his sight numerous times. He went to kill a man named Nabal. His name means fool because he kept David from getting his payment for protecting his flock. And so he went to go kill him, but Nabal had a wife named Abigail who came and stopped David from this murder. Because she knew, you're going to be the king. We know you're anointed. We know you're going to be the king. And, and you don't want this blood over your hand. And he said, blessed are you, Abigail, for God has given you this discernment. You could actually see beyond just some senseless act. 
David reacted to the word of God when he sinned with Bathsheba. He was confronted by Nathan the prophet. And so when Nathan looked at him and said, you are the man, David all of a sudden had a different way of looking at things. He didn't just see things the way they were. Even in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory and the inheritance of his saints. The eyes of your heart have to be enlightened. Paul knew this. He told the Ephesian church that. But he also understood this, that in whose case the God of this world, he tells the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, 4 to 6, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. They won't see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. This is so clear to us today. You've got people and families sitting side by side, the same genetic material, the same educational opportunities, the same intellectual capacity, listening to the same gospel and receiving it very differently. How can that happen? I mean, you sit in an engineering class, a nursing class, an English class, and you hear the instructor, read, and everybody takes notes, and they give an exam. And all the clever people who are taking notes and listening to the instructor, they give the exact same answers. I believe that to be true. Absolutely. Why? But then you give a gospel presentation to the same amount of people, same kind of people, all right there, cognitively getting it all and seeing it. And you say, now, what do you believe? And someone says, I'm convicted. I see the, the son of the living God. And another one says, that's, that's rubbish. Where does that come from? It comes right here, that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. This is why so many people see Christ today, but they don't see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. For God, who has said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the gospel, gospel knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It's God who shines in the heart, not your ability to grasp it. So if you're struggling here this morning, saying, yeah, I know about Jesus. I know he's the one who died on the cross, right? And he died for our sins, so I guess that gives us the way to heaven and all that. If that's all it is, you do have sight this morning. You do have sight, and we're going to see that. But there's something much more critical, which is what this passage is going to show us this morning, this, this little event that the Word of God expresses to us is that God is the one who gives insight. God is the giver of wisdom, and He alone is what transforms a fool into a sage. And this morning here, we're not only going to see sight and insight, which you're going to see both, but we're going to see the transition from sight to insight, which is what is so critical. And there's a critical teaching for Jesus' disciples on this most important transition. So here's what I want you to get. As we see again and, and unpack this little story here, this is actually a lesson for the disciples. And it's a critical lesson for the disciples. And if it's a critical lesson for, our, for his disciples, it is massively critical for us this morning that we have to understand this. And that's the transition from sight to insight. Now we've read the text and and Jesus is coming along and, and he's presented with a blind man. We see that's in verse 22. But what you need to understand is where this story is placed in its historical context. Just like anything. Jesus had been with his disciples now for over two years. Two years of walking with Jesus since they first saw him in John chapter 1. And I'll just set this now here in, in, in John chapter 1, Peter came and saw Jesus because Peter was a follower of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus was there and he looked at Peter. He looked at some of the disciples who were there. And Peter ran and grabbed his brother and said these words. He says, Come, I have found him who is called the Christ. Peter's looking for the Christ. He's looking for the Messiah. He's not just looking for a good prophet. So he was looking for something, and he brought 
Andrew, he brought his friends. He came in to see Jesus. So he was pretty excited from the beginning. He had been with Jesus from that time all the way now to where we are now to almost two years. That's a long time. Especially since Jesus was now in his public ministry and he was on the move. As soon as they got started, he was preaching. He began healing. He began casting out demons. Every synagogue they went to, the demons would scream out, Who are you, Jesus, Son of the God Most High? What have you to do with us? They'd scream and throw somebody down and run out. He healed thousands into the night. He had calmed a storm in Mark chapter 4. They were on a boat, and the storm was so big, they just got Jesus to wake up and said, Jesus, would you do something? you got to do something. And Jesus turned a mega storm into a mega calm. But you know what they did, these people who were with Jesus? They said, who is he? Who is this one? That even the wind and the, obeys, the, the waves obey him. He had fed 5,000 men plus their women and children. The little boy with five loaves and two fish walked on the water out to them in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in the middle of a storm. And I'll just read this to you. Mark chapter 6, verses 51 and 52, after Jesus had walked out to them in the middle of the lake. They got into the boat with them. The wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. Now get these words right here, verse 52. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. They did not gain any insight from him feeding all these people. So he walks on the water. They go down to the southeastern part of the lake, and he feeds another batch of people. 4,000 men plus their families. And then he goes back up to the top where we find ourselves in Mark chapter 8, right before this account, verses 11 to 13, and he meets the Pharisees, and they seek a sign from him from heaven. Can you give us a sign from heaven? Because they don't trust any of his signs he's been doing. We want God to give a sign from heaven about you. We don't trust your sign. And Jesus said these words that burn why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. None. You will not be given a sign. And so they get in a boat, and they start across the northern tip of Galilee, from the northwest to the northeast, across that, cutting across that top. They're going to the town of Bethsaida. And all of a sudden, they figured out they've only got one loaf of bread. So they begin arguing about who forgot to bring the loaf of bread, or who, the loaves of bread. They're arguing among themselves. Jesus becomes aware of it. He's frustrated because they've seen him feed 5,000, they've seen him feed 4,000 plus their families with nothing except for a few loaves and fishes. And now they're arguing that they don't think that he can make lunch for 13 on the boat. So it says in verse 17, Jesus looks at him and says, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? And he breaks, he says, When I fed the 5,000, when I fed the 4,000? And he was saying to them, Do you not yet understand? You see, the disciples have been with Jesus for over two years, seen many miracles, heard many biblical sermons, and yet still did not know who he was. They were very familiar with him. And familiarity is very dangerous. Because Jesus took the disciples in Mark chapter 6 to see his family in Nazareth, where he did some of his early preaching. In Nazareth, his family tried to kill him. Meaning the people who knew him in Nazareth as he preached, they tried to throw him off a cliff. Tells us in Luke chapter 4. And so, being familiar with Jesus starts to push our patience a little bit. Because Jesus starts to talk in ways that demand something of us. And so, just being familiar with Jesus says eventually, 
we got to do something about this man. And they tried to kill him. The disciples for two years have been acting in a way that is familiar with Jesus. I'm with him. I like the miracles. But I get panicked when somehow my life's not right or I'm fearful of something. And now he's seeing that they don't even understand who's in the boat with them. Do you not understand? Life changes when I'm in the boat with you. Your life hasn't changed. You know who I am. You can see. And so they get off. Verse 22 says they came to Bethsaida. And this is where we're going to see sight. Right here. Sight. They come to Bethsaida and they bring a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Now there's something very interesting about that statement. And it's the word they. Who are they? The people of Bethsaida. Okay, I got that. Why is that important? Because the people of Bethsaida are the same people who Jesus fed when he fed the 5,000. They came out of that village, Bethsaida. And they weren't necessarily after the food. It was the disciples who told Jesus, hey, we got to feed these people. They weren't looking for food. Actually, the disciples said to Jesus, let the people go so they can go buy food. There's a lot of villages around here. Got to feel compassion for them. The people came to Jesus for healing because he had done so much healing there. And they saw Jesus on the boat crossing over, so they just followed him on land, running as fast as they could, to catch up with him so when he landed, they got there and they said, ah, oh, we're here. We'd like you to do a miracle. We'd like you to heal us. It's those people who Jesus fed, and he fed them with five loaves and two fish. But there's not one that responded to his preaching, not one that cared about what his words were, not one even gave thanks. They just were happy to eat, and the next day they chased him down and said, more. It's those people who had rejected him when he fed them before. And now they're coming to him again. And they bring a blind man to him and implores them to touch him. They're begging him. The verb is parakaleo, where we get paraclete, the Holy Spirit. The idea of encouraging, imploring. We encourage you, please. We're giving you as, as much kind of emotion as we can. Heal this man. Really? Did they care about the blind man? Or was it possibly heal him and that starts the process and we'll all line up and start a medical clinic right here and get what we're after, which is healing. But just heal him. This was an unbelieving crowd who had, been, who had rejected Jesus. And remember what Jesus said. This is the words that need to carry in your mind. No sign will be given this generation. None except the sign of Jonah, the idea of resurrection. When you see me, Resurrect. That's the sign you're going to get. That's why verse 23 shows us that Jesus took the man by the hand and brings him out of the village. I'll heal him, but not with you involved. They wanted Jesus to do something for them. Jesus said no sign will be given to an unbelieving generation. Which, by the way, I'll just make a little side note here. It's an unbelieving generation that desires a sign and more signs. And the more you're unbelieving, the more God says there's no sign going to be given because you've been given the biggest sign, that of resurrection, which is ultimately spiritually a transformed life, which is something different, something new. It's a new life. It's born again. That's the sign. You want to believe Take a look at people at Bethany Community Church that lived differently than they did before they understood with insight who the Messiah was. That's the sign this community gets. Because there's no greater sign than husbands and wives who couldn't abide each other that now understand what it is to be biblically in love and submitting to one another. And the world says, how did that happen? That's a sign. 
Well, they were begging Jesus to do this, and Jesus took him by the hand and brought him out. And once he got him alone, the text here interestingly says, he took him and he began to have compassion on him and heal him. Yes, there's no sign given to that generation, but this man received grace, personal grace, right here. Jesus did not throw this man to the wolves. And so he took him alone. It says he laid his hands on the man's eyes and after spitting on him, and he said, do you see anything? And the man respond, responded by saying, they're walking around like trees. I see men walking around like trees, which brings up three questions for us. Three questions about this idea of sight. First question. It's kind of the obvious one that hits and the one that nobody can answer. But hopefully after today we can answer it. Why did Jesus spit on the man's eyes? Why did he spit on the man's eyes? Well, first, there's nothing in the text that tells us why. You can search all you want, but the words aren't there. So we have to use some of our Bible understanding, our Bible knowledge, and ask some pertinent questions, which is, has Jesus ever spit on anybody or used spit in any way before? Yes, he has. Are they perhaps the same or similar? Well, one is in John chapter 9 where he used spit to make mud and put on a man's eyes. That's different. He didn't spit on the man's eyes. He spit and he put mud, made mud, put it on the man's eyes. And why did he do that? Why did he make mud? Well, he made mud so the man would have to wash it off in a particular pool called Siloam. And the name Siloam was very important. It meant sent one or the, the one who is sent. And so Jesus wanted him to actually say the waters of the pool of Siloam washed this man's eyes off. And so basically you can see that it is the sent one who did this. Jesus was being very prophetic. He was explaining to the Jews how a prophecy was being fulfilled. So I'm making mud so that you have to wash off in that pool. That's why I use it in John chapter 9. Not the same. There's one other case, and it's very close. It's in Mark chapter 7 where there was a deaf man. A man who was not only deaf, but he spoke with difficulty. And his issue was, in those days, when you're deaf, you can't hear, but you can't speak, and you speak with kind of difficulty. People think that you have a demon. People think you're possessed. People think that you have some kind of mental issue. And so that's why you're an outcast. Jesus, in verse 33 of chapter 7, took him aside from the crowd by himself again, put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue with saliva. Now, why do you do that? Why do you put the fingers in the ears? That seemed like a practical joke. Here's what he was doing. Everybody else says that you are demon-possessed. Everybody else says you have a mental condition. I understand it's your hearing. I understand. You can't hear me. If I tell you, you wouldn't have any idea what I just said. <laughs> but if I do this, we have a connection, and you understand that I understand. It's your hearing. But not only that, I don't want to put my rough finger on your tongue. We've got to give it a smooth thing because the tongue is very, very sensitive. So after spitting, I put it on your tongue and say, I understand. This is me. I'm healing you. I understand. You and I now have an intellectual connection about what's wrong. This is not just some magical incantation. Heal everybody in front of me, that kind of thing. No, you're it's me who's healing you right here. That's what happened in Mark chapter 7. That's exactly what happened here in Mark chapter 9. He took the blind man out by himself and the disciples. I want you to know that it's not some prayer, some incantation, or a sacrifice that heals this man. It is me. The man can't see Jesus. The only thing they have is touch. And a blind man will have heightened sensation in his sensory feeling with his, with his skin and with his, especially around the facial features. And so he doesn't know anything. He's brought outside. And then Jesus, of course, puts spit on the ice and begins to rub with the fingers because you don't want to rub just, dra just directly with your fingers into the man's eyes. That's going to be painful. So what does the spit do? 
smooth surface, blind people can really identify with a smooth touch where it's going around the eyes. I understand. This is me. I'm going to heal you. I've got you out here, and I touch you, and I lay hands on you. So he did that just to say there's no incantation, no magic, just Jesus. I identify with your problem. It is your sight. And now since I touch you on the eyes, you know that I know for sure exactly what your issue is. It's right here, and I am touching you. It's through the physical touch. It's the physical connection with Jesus, not anything else. That's why he spit on the man's eyes. Second question. Why did Jesus ask the man, do you see anything? Do you actually see anything? Well, this is the only time in the Gospels where Jesus asked a person this kind of question. Whenever Jesus asked or whenever he uh, healed or performed miracles, he never asked questions for verification. He never asked anybody if there were side effects. Okay, don't go swimming for another couple hours after this. That comment never came. As soon as people were healed, they jumped up, lame people jumped up and ran. There was no need for verification. So what's going on here? We can only conclude one of two things. Either Jesus did not know himself and needed to see if his power was good or good enough, or if it was purely asking for the sake of the man, or one other as well, for the sake of the twelve who were there with him. Jesus was asking this specifically on behalf of the man so the man would know. And actually, you know what? The man didn't need to say it to know it. <laughs> if the man saw people walking around like trees, he didn't need to say it so that he, oh, yeah, I guess I believe people are walking like, around like trees. No, he knew that. So to get the man to say it audibly, what's it for? The 12 who are with him, wondering or just thinking, yep, the man can see now. No, you guys need to hear this. Can you see? Yeah, people like trees walking around, and all of a sudden, all 12 went around. Excuse me? Jesus, whoa, whoa, this has never happened before. That's a frightening thing. Just to give you a perspective. Just a little illustration came to mind here. There was a battle in the Old Testament with Joshua at a place called Ai, which is like a tiny little town. Like Morton, Illinois. No, Pekin. This is Ai. You got a couple of million Israelites led by Joshua, the warrior. He's got an army of about 600,000 men. Okay, so we, we got some advantage here. We just took out Jericho. We just took out Jericho. And now we're going, but there was sin in the camp by a guy named Achan, and he came in, buried the, sin, buried the treasure, and so now God says, I'm not, I, I was with you, but now I'm outside of the camp, and I'm fighting you. They didn't know this. So they go to battle against Ai. Oh, I'll get 20,000 men, go take care of that town. So they went, and they had a battle. And it didn't go so well. And the text says something interesting. It says, like, 30 people died. Now, if you're a general... And you said 20,000 and 30 people die. You know, that's like, okay, that's part of the rounding off error. I mean, push, guys, go, shoot, you know, go after them. That's 30 people. I, that happens. But what happened in the text? 30 people died. Joshua stopped it. He tore his clothes and he was in, oh, man, I can't believe this is happening. That doesn't make any sense. Only 30 people? Come on, Joshua. Let's kind of suck it up here a little bit. Let's go. Why? Because, whoa, 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 everything God has done up to this point has been perfect, undefeated, no problems, no deaths. If all of a sudden 30 guys die, what does that say? There's a crack in the armor. Our God is good up to a point. Kind of hits practically where we are today. So when these 12 see Jesus and they say, do you see everything? Well, kind of, men walking around like trees. It's like, whoa, whoa. There's a, there's a defect in our belief somewhere. What is it? Is it faith? Lack of it? I don't know. What's going on? This could happen to me. Question number three. 
moving quickly. But this is really the big question. Why did Jesus have a two-stage miracle? Why? Well, <coughs> it looks like a two-stage miracle here, but it's not. I mean, is this a case where Jesus gave the man too strong a vision? Whoa, 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 too close, too close. Whoa, back up, back up. <laughs> is that what this is? Maybe Jesus had to dial the miracle in? I don't think so. Was it that the man had weak faith? Faith is not even mentioned, but it's obvious the man had faith because he's standing there with Jesus. Otherwise, he'd be there in the village. So he's standing there with faith. No. This is not a two-stage miracle where he first spits on his eyes and rubs, and then he says, oh, like trees? Let me try it again. No. This is two separate miracles. Two completely separate miracles. Jesus told his, uh, his disciples a little bit earlier. He said, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it's something He sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. In other words, Jesus only does the works of God. If Jesus only does the works of God, what He did in this spitting of the eyes and, and rubbing was a work of God. It's what God did and then God said we stop. That's what Jesus said. He goes on in John 14, verse 10, he goes, The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does His works. God's doing the works. I'm the agent. God said, you're going to see men walking like trees, and that's it. And then Jesus again laid His eyes on, on His eyes, and He looked intently, and everything's restored perfectly. Question, why two miracles? Why two miracles? And the answer is right in front of us. It's two miracles because there are five different words that describe seeing in this passage. It's translated a little bit differently in your Bibles, but there are actually five different Greek verbs. The first verb is found in verse 23, and it's the word blepo. It means to just observe, to see right here. And uh, after Jesus laid his eyes on her, he said, do you see anything? Just tell me what you see. Give me an inventory. What do you see? Second word is found in verse 24. It says, and he looked up. That whole phrase, he looked up. That doesn't mean he looked up in the sky. That's the word anablepo, and it means to regain one's sight. It means you had it before, you lost it, and now you have it again. That's what that word means. It's the same word given in Acts chapter 9, verse 18, where it talks about Paul having the scales fall from his eyes. The third word is, means to take notice. Where he says, for I see them like trees walking around. I notice them like trees walking around. I notice them. Can't do anything. I'm catching sight, but I'm actually kind of taking some inventory. The fourth word here is he looked intently. He laid on his eyes on his eyes, and then he looked intently. Diablepo. It means to open your eyes widely. It means to see clearly. This is the same word in Matthew chapter 7 where he says, you hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye and then you can begin to take the this, this speck out of your neighbor's eye and then you can diablepo. See clearly. See? Unblinded by sin. And finally, after his eyes were restored, he began to see everything Clearly, That whole see everything clearly is the word emblepo. It means to stare, to gaze, to give consider, uh, serious thought, to consider. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says what? Consider the lilies of the field. Consider the birds of the air. It, he's saying look at them, but he's not really saying look, is he? He's saying think about them. Think about those things. Meditate on that. Everything here is about a progression in sight. It's a progression from sight to sight insight the man could see but that's not enough he had to get to where he could see everything clearly and when he saw everything clearly he knew who was in front of him it was truly the messiah the son of the living god is right here i now see everything clearly which is why jesus then took him and, and in verse 26 says and sent him to his home saying don't even enter the village do not go back to the village what tells us he did not live in the village he lived outside the village. He begged in the village. 
don't go back to work because you're not going to go to that job anymore. You don't have to beg. And no sign will be given to them other than your changed life. First, Jesus gave the man sight. Now he was going to give him insight. That was the whole point of the two-stage miracle, or two, two miracles here. And in doing that, it was a lesson for the disciples who'd been on the boat arguing about not having enough bread, saying you've had the Messiah for two years and you've had no idea who he is. That's what this is. Insight. Now, briefly, insight, because we're going to have to close on this, because I know we're, we're done here. But in the numerous cases of people who've recovered from blindness, the common condition of all of them is that they remain mentally blind. There was one case of a young man who, when he was talking to somebody after he got cured of blindness, the guy turned around and walked away, and, and the, the previous blind, the man who had been previously blind, actually thought the man was shrinking in front of him. As he turned around and walked away, he thought, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Because you're still mentally blind. How do we know the disciples got this on insight? We know this because the very next passage. They went out to Caesarea Philippi and he said, Who do men say that I am? Some said Elijah, some said John the Baptist, some said Jeremiah, some said the prophets. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Peter just jumps up and says, You are the Christ! You are the Christ. I get it. And Jesus said, we know this in Matthew, he said what? Peter, you did not say this, but our Father in heaven is what gave this to you. You just got insight. Just like that. And now is the time for them to get the insight. From sight to insight. Because I told you, I was here on an African, where there was an African missionary, Bethany Baptist, we swore an oath that we would never come back to that church. My wife and I swore an oath. We said it was so bad, missionary, some guy with all kinds of African stuff, we're not coming back. And then, just about a year later, just about a year, through relationships and some various other things that took place, we were back in that church. I was not as happy going to the church, but we were going to church. And uh, my wife had been given insight about a month before, but I didn't know it. And so as we're there and we're listening to the sermon, she's crying. And I'm asking her about her tears because I thought it was related to the, the, the funeral of my father that passed away a couple months ago. I said, so it's about my dad. I didn't think, I, th I think that time is over. I think we're done crying now. And she said, this has nothing to do with your father. And at that point in time, with those words, I could see clearly. I was a willful hypocrite who was content with just knowing about Jesus, knowing about what he did, trusting in the baptism I had when I was eight years old, and letting that be that part of my life. And my other part is going to be my career and everything else that I'm doing. And all of a sudden, I had insight, and I saw everything clearly. And God gave that to me, and that moment, bam, there was insight, and everything changed. Everything changed. And I knew that meant, if you're serving the living God, it's a 24-7 deal. It's not just we go to church on Sunday. And that's why we went to Africa. And I'll just tell you, how do you get this? How do you get this? It's very simple. You just ask. Just ask. Solomon writes, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you'll discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. If you just seek, if you just ask. And for you at Bethany Community Church, who's saying, yeah, I have asked, and I've got that. What can I do? Is this for me, or is this just for those who need insight? I said, we need insight every day. You know what you can do? I found out after going, just before going to Africa, I found out by talking to a young man Oh, he's the same age as me, I guess, Joe Youngman. He said, you know, Dave, you were kind of a slippery guy, you know, coming in and out, trying to get a hold of you and try to get you to come to church. I wouldn't behave really properly. But he said, we prayed for you every Sunday 
our Sunday school class prayed for you and your family every Sunday. We didn't stop, even though you rejected your neighbor. And all of a sudden, one day, out of nowhere, it's one of those strange things, and it just so happened, insight. God provides that. You can be very familiar with the gospel. This, this community, this country is very familiar with Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and familiar with this thing called the gospel in the Bible. Many people in this country have sight. How many have insight to say, oh my, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and this is, this is now who I am, and this is what the implications are for me in my life. So I just ask you this morning, where are you? Are you stuck with sight and this is just another church service to come to? Or have you been kindled with insight to say, whoa, I'm not so worried about bread in my cupboard this afternoon if I have the living God in my boat. I'm not so worried because I know He takes care of the lilies of the field and He takes care of the birds of the air. I now see it. Are you there? Or are you back with, yeah, I understand the Bible. Don't talk. I understand. You don't have to talk to me. I, I heard it. Or are you still with sight? And you see everything walking around like trees. These 12 men turned the world upside down. Starting in the book of Acts. And had that kind of impact on the world. You want to have an impact? On the community, even tougher. You want an impact on your family? It takes insight, not just sight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. and Again, Bethany community and how we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you mostly, Lord, for your gift of insight to us so that we can see you for who you are, and that gives us great joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.